He has wiped out by his grace through faith in Christ your every sin, every sin, past, present, future. Christian hedonist is somebody who says that my greatest joy, my greatest good is God. And therefore, I will pursue that joy and I will pursue that God above all else. So God's glorified and I'm satisfied. You are now listening to the Pastor Discussions Podcast. What's up, everybody? Welcome to episode number 110-ish of the Pastor Discussions Podcast. I'm John. And I'm Joe, and this is your mostly weekly conversation on the <laughs> and the Christian life. We're becoming more consistent. This is the second week in a row after like a series of, of missed weeks. But uh, we're back. We're part of the Bar Podcast Network. You can check out uh, their website, get more information about them, and hear great biblical content for your ear holes at thebarpodcast.com. And then check out uh, the Think Podcast with Joel Sedicase. They just, uh, he just did one on, uh, on atheists with Cy Ten Bruniket. Yeah, he is a harsh dude. He is, he is intense. Um, he might go, in my opinion, he's over the top. But he he's a quintessential debater, um, but uh, it's worth checking out. And um, yeah, that's all the admin stuff we have. We are like we're actually recording at a at a regular time, and we've thought through what we're going to talk about in advance. We have a whole bunch of weeks planned. <laughs> we do have a whole bunch of weeks planned. <laughs> this is unusual for us. Uh, so we had a visit yesterday. Dun, from dun, dun. from a from a friend, an and old friend, an old friend who no longer lives here. He lives in Kansas, and uh, he'll just stop by. He he travels for his job, and he'll just stop by occasionally and sort of drop in like a tornado, and then leave equally fast. And with uh, destruction in his wake. with destruction in his wake, yeah. And uh, so we ended up just sitting around talking for. Well, you were talking to him a little bit longer than yeah, I was. he was here for a little over an hour. So. Yeah. So, uh, but he said this thing uh, about looking, not just listening to what Jesus says, but looking at what Jesus does. And that got us thinking because we just finished up a sermon series on discipleship. And uh, the, the sort of quick summary of it is that when, when Jesus gave the Great Commission, he said, go make disciples of all nations. Uh, and the question is, how did they know what to do? They weren't given like a blueprint. They weren't given a, a step-by-step instruction manual. How did they know what that looked like? And the answer, I think, is they, they just replicated what was done for them. They looked at what Jesus did for them, and then they did that in in their lives with others. And so in, in order to really maybe improve or grow our ability to make disciples, we need to look at what Jesus did, uh, not just what it, he, not just at what he said. And and one of the things that's sort of the premise of the sermon series is that when you look at what Jesus did, there there are three big principles that he applied in making disciples: relationships, experiences, and information. And so, what we thought we'd do is we'd take uh, one of those this week, relationships, and talk a little bit about that as far as specifically what Jesus did. Um, in conjunction with what he said. So uh, one of the things that um, one of the things that he said that I think is significant is he said, if anybody uh, doesn't love or if anyone loves their father, mother, brother, sisters more than me, is not worthy to be my disciple. And, and so there's this, there's this layer of loyalty to Jesus that, that surpasses everything. And when other people have that, that layer of loyalty to Jesus that surpasses other loyalties, that sort of bonds people together and creates in us a relationship uh, just by virtue of the fact that we're following the same Lord. Yet at the same time, I think there, there can be some confusion in what that looks like. Because I think that there, there could be a misunderstanding or a misconception that we should have this really tight, close-knit relationship with every believer in our church, sort of heralding back to the days of a church plant where there were just a few people and you're really close. Or just small churches in general. 
Yeah. They, that's, that's kind of the expectation. So if you've been in a small church, you get to know everybody. Um, but what I still think that's even a facade too, because you feel like, you know, everybody, but it's just not, you, none of us have, some have more than others, but none of us have the relational capacity to have yeah. that many relationships and have them be close like that. Christ yeah. didn't even have it. And that's, that's the, it's so funny. The church presses, like how many church press small group ministries? Mm-hmm. And while I get it, cause I think people are acknowledging that we don't have the capacity to have relationships with however many people, whether you're in a church of 5,000 or 550 or anywhere in between, you only have so much that you can have close knit relationships with. So there's there's a an understanding of that, but at the same time, it's almost this forced thing, right? right. And and so I want to attack that here in a minute. But I like just to get back to what you're talking about, Christ. The the reason we're going to talk about like w- let's look at what he did. So what did he do? So he picked twelve guys, and this was something that uh, Gabe brought up yesterday. This is the guy that visited us. Um, and then out of those 12, he had a, a closer relationship with three. So he has a close relationship with 12. Mm-hmm. And then he's got a, a closer relationship with three. And then an even closer one with one. Right. So did Christ play favorites? Did he neglect others? Now, he didn't He didn't neglect the crowds when they came or right. other people. He knew he had relationships with Mary and Martha and Lazarus, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, we've got these these other characters that he's got relationships with. Yeah. But the ones that he's spending his time, he got with, invited to a wedding. Yeah. <laughs> and, and the, but the ones that he's spending his time with, the ones that he's investing in, the one that he's close with. Yeah. It's a small number. I think it highlights the importance of relationships. Don't have to be with everybody. Like the yes, same relationship, right? The same. So, relationship. so yeah. you you said this quite a bit, and I've ripped it off quite a bit, and in the conversations. <laughs> but there's levels of um, relationship. So you're going to have really intimate, close, but you only have so much capacity for that, and you only have so much time for that because that takes time and it yeah. takes investment. And then you got another level of of good friends, probably that are people you hang out with, and then you've got this another level of maybe another set, and then you've got this. I think. I think there's four levels for uh, for believers as they look at it. Right. Maybe five because you got to, I think unbelievers are at, at, a, at another level, and you've got to understand um, you can have a relationship with them, but there's a, there's always a purpose in those relationships, and they're not going to be the same as. So let's say four four people. levels of relationship with believers. Yeah. So you've got those close ones. You've got then this other tier of people you you hang out with regularly, and that's where I would probably put what most churches would say small group. Uh, people are in mm-hmm. um, and then you've got uh, this other level of friends but not maybe in this small group and then you've got the rest of the church which you have a I think there's an obligation to be in relationship with those people not not as a rule but there should be a desire because there's the commonality mm-hmm. of holding to the the same gospel same savior love for the same god you're accountable to one another yeah. by virtue of the fact that you're in the church together and so while that relationship isn't maybe going to look like the first three levels there's still got to be something there yeah um and that's the one that i think gets neglected pretty often so and i think you see those three tiers with christ and even the fourth one because he doesn't neglect the crowds yeah there's a so i've we came Arbor you Drive. You can see the fifth one with the, how he talks to the Pharisees. That's true. <laughs> so, the, <laughs> woe to you, <laughs> unbeliever! Scribes and Pharisees, you hypocrites. Um, uh, that's not even the same, though. That's yeah, like, that's I, like the religious people. Yeah, that's not like I, I think you see that that fifth tier with the woman at the well, right? Um, yeah. Or with Nicodemus. Uh, so, anyway, neither here nor there. The uh, <laughs> maybe there's a sixth tier with the <laughs> with the religious hypocrites. Uh, but the uh, so w- when we came to Arbor Drive, Arbor Drive is the largest church we've ever attended. Uh, when we were in Washington, when I was a new believer, we attended a, a church that probably had uh, seventy five or so as a church plant. Uh, when we moved to Missouri on a good day, we had about 75 to 80. Uh, and then we came here and on Sunday mornings, it jumps up to 200, 220, somewhere in there. 
And uh, I found that incredibly overwhelming uh, as a pastor because there is this there is this need to have relationships with people in the body in a pastoral context mm-hmm. to be able to shepherd well. And I was just like, I have, I have relational limits, like significant relational limits. Like I'm not, I don't think, I just want to point this out. I don't think anyone is void of having those. Agreed. Like they might mass them different and high them different. And they might have a little bigger volume, but how many guys have we talked about in like from the pastoral perspective, go in and try to, be in a real relationship with everybody yeah. and they burn themselves out so quickly. And in a relationship with everybody. Right. Yeah. Cause they just don't have the capacity to do that. Yeah. So when we came here, um, it was a, it was a real struggle to think through that because like on one hand you have the, the expectations where the, I think unrealistic expectations that, that some church members have of what the relationship with the pastor should be like. Uh, but on the other hand, you do have a genuine desire to know the people and to to be in fellowship with the people, be in relationship with the people, so that you can so you can care for them well and shepherd them well and love them well in that capacity. And I had this epiphany because I I, I found myself thinking like, man, it would be really nice if we could kind of have that smaller church. And I've heard that before too. I had this epiphany as I was thinking about that. Even in Missouri, there were these layers in our church in Missouri. I mean, there were people that I knew that, that we'd see one another on Sunday mornings and I'd ask them how things were going in their, on, in their lives. I knew things that were going on in their lives. They knew things that were going on in my life. Uh, yet at the same time that there wasn't an intimacy there, it was, it was a relationship, but it was a, like that lower level of relationship. And then there were people that um, I was involved with where there would be, uh, times where we'd get together occasionally throughout the week uh, where there would be phone calls or text messages where we'd sort of be involved in the same ministry yeah. area together. Uh, and those relationships were a little bit closer, a little bit deeper. And then there were like two or three people in that church where I would see them on a weekly basis, two at least once a week, probably two or three times a week. Um we had a, a very close relationship. And to this day, uh, I still have that kind of relationship with them, though separated by, by distance. But um, as I started thinking about that and reflecting on that, I, I realized that like it doesn't matter what size of church you have. There's still going to be those layers because we're limited beings. And which, which, by the way, as a side note, makes... The fact that God knows each of his children intimately and personally that much more amazing because we're, we're constantly confronted with the reality that we can't do that. And it just shows how much higher than us he is, how much greater than us he is, and how uh, we reflect him in an imperfect way, in a limited way. And so I think that that's freeing for us because it takes the pressure off of us to try to have those types of intimate relationships with everybody. And I think what to your point, Christ models that in a way that frees us to be able to, to accept and embrace different layers of relationships and be committed to different layers of relationships and allow those different layers of relationships to evolve and to grow naturally without number one, it being forced and without number two, running ourselves ragged and trying to, to do something that we can't do, if that makes sense. Yeah. I, so discipleship starts with relationships. So it starts with relationship with God. Mm-hmm. Right. And so that's the common thing that, that bonds and, and that's the common thing that we start with. And then discipleship starts like, so you've got this, so there's information there, right? There's a, there's a message that's believed, it's a relationship with God that we have in common. Mm -hmm. And um, so discipleship then starts with relationship, starts with with relationship with God, then relationship with other believers. Yeah. Um, And so I think the next question is then what kind of relationship, like how does, how does this relationship that we're talking about, like why is this layered approach 
important in the discussion on discipleship. Cause it, so we're, we're talking about discipleship through relationships, experiences, and information. How does, why is that layered approach important um, for discipleship? Um, I think the answer comes in the fact that you really, if, if, if discipleship is, and, and kind of maybe we need to back up and, and define discipleship a little bit more, uh, more than just saying relationships, experiences, and information, because I think there's a common misconception that relationship is merely transfer of information. Uh, and just no discipleship <laughs> is merely, did I say, you said relationship. Yeah. Sorry. Discipleship. Discipleship, yes. discipleship is yeah. merely transfer of information. Yeah. And when we have that mentality, then discipleship is reduced to showing up to a class. But what we see with Jesus is that, relationships and experiences were the vehicle for impartation of information. So the, the disciples felt they could come to him with fears. They could come to him with questions. They could challenge him. I mean, Peter's like, no, you're not going to the cross. Right? I mean, whoa, that's, that's, <laughs> that's a little, that's, that's bold. Um, and Thomas says, unless I see him, I'm not going to believe, you know, that there's, there's this, there's this aspect where human beings being designed for relationships is one of the ways that God has made us to learn and grow. And so we see this in, in our families. Even um, I have a different relationship with my kids than I have with your kids. Uh, and that relationship with my kids is more intimate. It's closer. And that allows me to be able to impart information in a, in a way that's different and that doesn't mean that the relationship that I have with your kids is insignificant or bad or anything else. It just means that it's a different kind of relationship. And so relationships are important to discipleship because relationships are one of the three vehicles by which we grow as Christians. The relationships provide accountability. Relationships provide encouragement. Relationships provide opportunities for growth through observation and through emulation um, relationships provide, uh, I think I said accountability, but, uh, they provide, uh, mutual growth through sharing what we're seeing with one another. Um, it's, it's a basic building block of, of human beings. I mean, it's not good that man should be alone. I'll make a helper that's fit for him type of thing. So we're created for relationships. Our, our, our salvation in essence is a relationship with God that's been restored. There's a trustworthiness that happens yes. differently when you, information is coming from someone you have relationship with versus someone who doesn't. We don't, right? So you get to know the person, you know the heart behind what they're saying, and all of a sudden they're what they're sharing with you or instructing you in or encouraging you in or rebuking you in or vice versa right. has a different effect because there's a relationship there. Yeah. It's not simply information. This is the, this is why I think this is why the corporate worship service in person is so important. Getting to know the other people in the church and the one who's preaching you is so important. That's why you can't emulate that while watching on a screen. Right. Is because there's there's a relational aspect to preaching and singing and praying in the corporate service that is missing, um, and we instinctively know this, but we don't always recognize it uh, in in the time that it's happening. So, like I think there's a, I think the impact of the information is far greater, which yeah. is why it's so, why the relationship is so important within the within the structure of a relationship with one to another. Two things on, on that too. Like when you, when you were saying that relationships require personal contact, right? You, uh, this is, this is where social media has really warped our view of relationships because you can have friends that you've never met on social media. Um, well, I was even thinking like along this vein, like your friends in Missouri, like why is it that, there's a longing to be together. Why is it that you'll take trips down there to go see them and they'll yeah. take trips up here to come see you and not just be 
be on the or phone FaceTime. or FaceTime. Yeah, because like, we want to be right. together. There's a togetherness like, aspect. That's what I'm of, saying. We, we, I think this is built into our DNA by God that we would be with one another, but we know these things. Yeah. And yet we don't always grasp that piece. Yeah. And we can have, I mean, you can have some kind of relationship with somebody online, right? right? I mean, like I, there are guys in the cohort, in the, in the practical shepherding cohort, the revitalization cohort that I have a relationship with using air quotes. And, and it is a relationship. It's like, we know of one another. We are, able to encourage one another, but it's so limited because it's online. We yeah. haven't met in person. Now when we were, when we were going to have the, when we were, when they were going to do T4G, one of the things that, that we had talked about is craft uh, is in Louisville. We're going to have a, a gathering, a get together mm-hmm. so we could actually meet one another. And why is it that we, why is it that we wanted to get together and meet one another? Uh, because, we all understand intuitively that a relationship that doesn't have personal contact and personal knowledge is extremely limited. So to your point of why we gather together, part of the reason we gather together is to foster and encourage and and grow those relationships. The second thing off of what you were saying is, uh, relationships allow us not only to know the heart of the person that's, that's telling us something, but they also allow us to know the heart of the person that we're telling something to. So I know that I, I have to talk to my wife differently than I would talk to my parents on, on certain things. And that's because of relationship. Like you understand one another, you get to know one another on a deeper level and it allows you to be more effective in communicating truth because you understand, like, if I say it this way, they're going to take that the wrong way. I need to maybe take a different approach with this. Um, and we were just talking uh, before we started about engaging in social media about, and that just brought that up. It's like, how difficult is it to have a legitimate conversation? Right. Yeah. It's super, super hard on social media because people go... They jump off emotional cliffs and tangents. They misread what somebody else is saying. Right. How much of that is exactly what we're talking about? Yeah. There's no relationship there, at least real relationship. There's maybe acquaintance right. and yeah. knowing another person. That's a good distinction. But you you don't really you don't know the heart behind what somebody is saying. Right. You start reading into what they're saying versus maybe grasping at what is the core here. And like those those things we're all prone to that anyway but those are exasperated and i think it highlights this need that we have for intimate relationship and that can't happen through these mediums that like how many people are going like there's this big push right to not go back to offices to not go right yeah like we can work from home and i'm not saying that's good or bad but i'm just from an observation standpoint I think what will happen if we do that is what is um, work productivity is going to plummet. Yeah. Because people, whether they identify this or not, desire to be around other people. Even you, Jake Churchill, who likes to (laughs) sit in your basement and you say you don't want to be around people. Like I've seen it enough in in each of them when they actually hang out with people that they they like and, and that... They've got those things to connect with. with. Yeah. Well, it, even that connection, it brings it brings them into it. It, it lifts them up out of this funk or or the way that they they normally are. They think they are, and maybe they don't even realize that it's happening. But something different happens, and, and I've seen it happen again and again and again. Well, and how much of how much of our growth happens through conversations that don't even start out talking about a specific topic that we end up talking about. Yeah. Right. So like take, take the workplace environment, like how much creativity is sparked through conversations with people that you know, um, where you, where you go in and, and you sit down and you're talking about something and somebody has an idea and, and then how much of that, how much of that communication miss or miscommunication or mis misrepresentation or misunderstanding of what somebody's saying happens because so much of our communication as human beings is nonverbal. So the, the, the fact that we need to be together in the same space to be able to, to is, recognize that communication is accented yeah. by the fact that we communicate so much non-verbally mm. 
and we don't even recognize it. Like, I, um, so when I was taking a, a preaching course, uh, one of the things that, that they talked about was, you know, uh, I think, I think it's 30% of communication is verbal and 70% is nonverbal. So in other words, the, the point was like the, the voice inflection, the hand gestures, the things that you do naturally as you talk, the eye contact, the, the way that you respond when something is said or the way that you respond when you say something communicates. And that's a big part of how the hearer receives. And so even in relationships, even if you're, even if you're talking about, about discipleship relationships and, and being able to communicate truth, how much does that highlight the importance of in-person relationship? And that's what Jesus is. He just spends time with these guys. I mean, he's got his 12 that are, that are following him around all these places that he goes. He's got the three that he takes to the Mount of Transfiguration and, and things like that. And then he's got these times where he's just talking to Peter. He's just talking to John or, you know, John and James are lounging on him and, uh, and, and so all of these things indicate relationship. I mean, the, the connection between Jesus saying, uh, you'll deny me three times and the end of the gospel of John, where Jesus says, do you love me? Do you love me? Do you love me? That's a relational connection. He's highlighting the relationship. Um, He's highlighting, I love you. Do you love me? And he's like, Lord, you know, I love you. And he says it three times for a reason. To, to solidify in, in Peter, I mean, that doesn't happen through non-personal mediums, if that makes sense. Right. Okay, so I think we've established... Beat that horse. I think we've established that relationships are are the, the foundational building block for, to use r- random uh, language of, like, structured curriculums here, the, the, building, <laughs> the building block for discipleship, right? Yeah. It, it's, it's what's at its core. Okay, so churches, I think, instinctively know this. I wanted to get back to this because yeah. I, this is my hobby horse right now. But uh, <laughs> that's why they created small group ministries. Mm-hmm. So the issue that I'm seeing with small group ministries is relationships that last happen organically and naturally with the people that we identify with. Um, that, so there's there's the gospel commonality, right? right. And that's the... For, so for all those tiers of relationships, that's the commonality. It puts us in the but, same family. But what puts you into tier one or tier two? And that's where those commonalities and uh, the the same values uh, we're walking. Maybe sometimes we're walking through. It's not always we're walking through the same things. Because right. I've got great friends that are 25 years older than I, than I am yeah. that I would count in that first, second tier, probably yeah. second tier. Um, I've only got about capacity for two in the first tier. So, <laughs> so in that second tier. Um, so it doesn't necessarily have to be that, but there, there's enough bond there. There's enough commonalities there. There's enough things that um, we see the same. We look yeah. at things the same way. We look at the world the same way. That helps to bond us tighter. And I think churches in their small group ministries, like this is what we've done. And I've seen other people do this. I've seen other people do some different things. So we've got a multi-generational church. We've got lots of different people and lots of different phases in life. Culturally, we're kind of the same, but we also have some distinctions in uh, our generations about how we relate. Right. Right. And so what our small group ministry has tried to do is take those and figure out how can we help, um, foster relationship between those uh, people into this level two, this tier two right, relationship. Yeah. And so we push those people into these, these groups. Right. And then we sit back and kind of scratch our head of why it's not working. Yeah. Why aren't these relationships forming? And a lot of churches are doing that. Um, I've talked to quite a few people who have been in small groups and they really connect with two or three other people in the group. And then, every, then the other people are like, man, I don't, I would, they're okay, but I would rather not hang out with them. Mm-hmm. Like why? And, and 
That's the Wait, general are the, are the person that they can, like the one person A connects with two or three other people and then within the, two the group other people no are like, and then, I don't connect no with person they a. they connect so you get okay three, okay so you get but two, then there's other people that are left three. out You're right and they, yeah okay and they're gotcha. not connecting gotcha okay I'm and, tracking and as leadership or as churches we're, we continue to push yeah. that model yeah. of connect 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 and people all of a sudden get discouraged it's like well I'm supposed to have a relationship with all these people at yeah. the same level. There's almost this Christian guilt thing that comes yeah. out uh, in our small groups because of how we're pushing this. And I think we just need to, we've got to rethink how this works. I, I'm not against small group ministries, but I'm I'm wondering if we've got the right goals yeah. in mind with small group ministries. I wonder if we have the right understanding of uh, relationships. And yeah, who... And is, is sure. like, the right understanding of capacity and layers of relationships that, that feeds into that as well. Um, Cause I think what ev- inevitably ends up happening is you get say six or seven couples in a small group, six or seven families. And there's this, everybody gets this feeling of I'm supposed to have a relationship with everybody in this family, kind of, yeah. kind of the same. And when I, when I don't have that with each family and I've got it with two, I feel I can almost feel like, guilty right. with hanging out with those two right. or um, magnify that by 10 for a pastor. Yeah. <laughs> right. Like, I mean, seriously, like that was one of the, w- when I came up here, one of the, one of the pieces of advice that uh, our pastor gave me, which I ignored is don't get close with, with people in the church, treat everybody the same. Um, and, and I don't think that's healthy because we're made for those relations. We need that. Everybody needs those relationships. So I think that, not only is this an issue for small groups, but if you're, if we, we have quite a few pastors that are listening to this, but this is, this is an issue for pastors as well within the context of their, their church community. I think that, that believers in the church, if you're not a pastor listening to this, you need to understand that. Like that's, that's, you need to understand this. And so pastors need to understand the, the pressure, the implicit pressure that gets put on people in small groups. Uh, as well as the congregation that are in those small groups need to understand that so they can fight against that. But the other side is true too. Like the, 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 the congregation needs to understand the implicit pastor that's or pa- pressure that's put on pastors as well as the pastor so that they can combat that. And so like, like I think that's a really, really important point that you brought up though is you do feel this pressure to have the same relationship with everybody in that group. And here's the question, how are those groups normally formed? By the church, just, yeah. I mean, by looking you, at it, get in the group. Yeah, get, get involved. Group. Yeah, exactly. We'll, we'll put you together with people who we think you would click with. Exactly, but we don't really know. So there's a there's a few things like C.S. Lewis again is helpful in this. He said that uh, friendship begins the moment that when you is he ever not when helpful? is he ever not helpful? That's true. <laughs> so true. Um, friendship begins the moment you say, "What you two? I thought I was the only one." So there's, there is a commonality. So, and that transcends generational boundaries. Well, that, and that transcends to each believer. Too. Yeah, exactly. Because each believer has experienced the same thing in coming to faith in Christ. But even with that, like that, that deeper relationship, I think you don't discount commonalities. Like you might, you, you, you might, right, not, but I, you I, not, I, not, not, what I'm saying is like, and I, I, I you get to what you're getting to. I think people, believers can discount that yes. they can have some type of relationship yes. with another believer who has nothing in common yes. with them from a worldly perspective or likes or phase of life or whatever it is, you still have the common bond of being believers. Absolutely. And therefore, we do still have a responsibility, but we need to see that responsibility differently than those next tiers right. of relationship, which is what you're getting that's, at. Yeah, that's what I was talking uh, because like those those different tiers come about through, and I'm not even saying that the people are alike, like you and I are very different in our personalities. Um, That's an understatement. That is an understatement. (laughs) But at some point there was a, what you two, I thought I was the only one. And, and, and what we found is the more that we got together and and talked and, and hung out that we had more of these commonalities than we realized. And so like, I'll just give an example of, um, Ralph Brumbaugh who recently passed away. He's, in his seventies, like the kind of person that, that you would not think that a younger person would, you know, you get the talking about the generational divide, you know, different philosophy of ministry, different way of approaching life in certain areas. And I remember he was, I was just talking to him one Sunday and he said something about flying a drone. 
and I was into drones. Like I was like, I really want to learn to fly a drone. So I started asking him questions about it. And that little conversation led to more conversations, which led to finding more commonalities, which led to ultimately when, when he passed away, like I really felt his passing away because he was, I considered him a friend. Um, if it's I was like, it's, it's like you, each relationship needs that hook. Yeah, it does. It like, needs that if, starting if you're point. Gonna go, if you're going to be in tier in those upper tiers, if there's a, there's a hook that I don't remember. I don't remember what, <laughs> what our either. stars was. It was Gabe. It was Gabe. That's, like, <laughs> it probably was because <laughs> that was the first time we actually had a real conversation. He was here. Yeah. Um, but so there's there's that right. Um, but then if you take it a step further from that, that means that there's a responsibility for everybody to be willing to have those conversations. So I think one of the biggest barriers, like, so you talk to people that are maybe like, I'm not really connected in a church. Or I'm not really, con- I don't feel connected. I don't feel like I have relationships in this church, um, in whatever church that is. The question is, have you taken responsibility to try to foster that? That's number one. Number two is, are there other people in the church that feel that responsibility to foster that as well? So it starts with the person you sit next to. It starts with the person that you run into when you when you come in the door. It starts with the person that you're standing in line with while you're getting coffee or whatever that is. Uh, there's all these opportunities for these little seemingly innocuous conversations that might lead to something else. And I think what so often what we do is we limit ourselves either through our own introvert tendencies or through the relationships that we already have where we don't look for new people or we don't notice new people. Um, and, and, that, and, and what we like to do is we like to play the blame game and say, well, this isn't a welcoming church because so-and-so or nobody came up and talked to me. Okay, well, that might be true. Okay, maybe nobody did come up and talk to you. And maybe that should have happened. Let's let's grant that for a moment. The question that I always have is, did you go talk to anybody? Yeah, I think that that's a, a great starting point. I also would, I think we're getting close to our running out of time Do we time have here. a time I don't know. anymore? But <laughs> I, I think the other thing is in this, I would say two things. Um, we need to understand that relationships are the beginning of discipleship. That's, that's the whole point. But we also need to understand that you're not going to have the same relationship with everybody and other people are going to have different relationships with different people. Yeah. Don't be jealous of that. Exactly. Don't be envious of like, this is the obvious example, but everybody wants to have the tight relationship with the pastor or pastors or, or those there's those people in the church that are, they have that wooing personality, right? Mm -hmm. That people want to have a relationship with, or they have a title. And so everybody wants to be that person's tier two, tier one friendship. Um, Maybe that's not for you. Maybe you're supposed to be, have that relationship with somebody else in the church. Yeah. And that relationship is going to be in tier three or tier four. Yeah. Like don't be okay with the relationships that God um, has for you and the people that he's put in your life and be thankful for that because he's put them there for a reason. Absolutely. Um, so I, I think I, I can find myself at times being envious of other people's ability to, to seem to relate easier Mm -hmm. and, uh, have deeper relationships with people different than I have. And what that can do is it can make us neglect the relationships that we have or to value the ones or not see them as, as, the gifts and that they are to us and, and how much we actually uh, enjoy them and value them. So I would say like, like identify those relationships, be okay with them. And then to your point, be looking for new ones. Yeah. Always be looking. Don't neglect the responsibility of having a conversation with somebody who you don't really know. And, and if this, they stay in that level, that's fine. That's that's what I was going to say. It's, it's important to understand tiers of relationships in order for that to happen because that way that allows you to have that conversation without feeling the pressure of, oh, man, I need to be a best friend with this person. Yeah. Like that's not what we're saying. We're saying that like that if that, that the best friend thing starts with hello. It starts with a conversation. Not every hello has to exactly. elevate to that, exactly. that level. And that the, <coughs> excuse me, the Rona, the, uh, the other thing that I, w- I wanted to just throw in there real quick is understand that there's different time investments for different tiers. 
right? So tier one relationships, or tier one relationships, so like, so cold and mechanical. Uh, <laughs> well, it's like, how do you explain it know. so people can grasp it? Because REI is cold too. Yeah. Relationships experience information and you put a graph up there. With yeah, I did put a graph up. Parts. <laughs> but people need something to, to grasp yeah. to, to get this. And I think like looking at those. I agree. Like, I agree. So tier one, if you're, if you're, if you have a tier one friend, I was gonna say it's gonna take a significant more. It's gonna take significantly more time to for yeah. that friendship to get to that point yeah. than it takes for the tier four relationship. So you can sustain a lot of tier four relationships. You cannot sustain a lot of tier one relationships or even tier two relationships. Though right. it's a pyramid, right? So like you've got and 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 the closer you get to the top of the pyramid, the more time investment is required, which means. Two things. Number one, you have to be willing to invest the time if you want the return of those types of relationships. Yeah. They don't just happen. But number two is it means you have to be wise and selective in pursuing those relationships. Like, I, I really mean that. I think you need to be, I think that there, Jesus was selective in who he chose and he was intentional about spending time. And, and that doesn't mean that he neglected the crowds. That doesn't mean that the other 11 were neglected when he was spending time with just John. Like the, the, but in a world, in a culture where we are pulled in a thousand different directions and pressures put on us to do everything well and to do everything now and, and to be involved in every single thing, like the value of saying no has been lost. Mm. And I think that, that, that that turning down um, and prioritizing your life and turning down certain things to invest in other things that are more valuable that will bring a bigger return in your discipleship and in in your life as far as giving uh, value and helping you grow in your relationship with Christ is a necessity in order for this thing to work properly. Um, and so you, you might. You might, and, and, and that means that you got to be okay with like, hey, we went to dinner and that was great and, and we didn't really connect like that. That's okay. Yeah. You know? Um, and I know that there are, there are those, it, it's just, you can't, you can't manufacture it. Like you can't force it. You can't make right. friends. Right. You, you become friends. And, and it's almost supernatural in the way it happens. And you shouldn't, like, you shouldn't in most cases feel bad for that. Yeah. Like the, the part where it becomes dangerous is when you value those tier one and tier two and neglect three and four. Right. Like that, that's the danger in this. So, so two maybe, ditches, right? Yeah, so maybe, wanting everybody to be a tier one friend yeah. or only valuing tier one friends. And then only caring about being yep. in those relationships there. There's balance to this. So m my encouragement to people is don't, feel guilty for having two or three people that you hang out with a ton. Yeah. And at the same time, don't neglect the responsibility to have those more, I'll call it casual relationships, even though that's, I think that's a terrible way to talk about it, but, it, but understand that those relationships are important too, Yeah. but understand where they're at in the scheme of, in our pyramid scheme of pyramid tier scheme. one, two, <laughs> three, and four. So, and be okay with where you're at because you're going to be in tier four to some people. Right, yeah. You're That's not going to be point. in everybody's tier three, two, or one. Right. And understand that you have some that are in tier one and others that are in tier four. Yeah. Let's be okay with that um, and understand that that's naturally how God's created us to function. Um, I think... If we can start to grasp that, then we can actually start to grasp what discipleship really is. Because discipleship is not like you were talking about a class where a teacher imparts information to a disciple. It's discipleship is two people, one normally more mature than the other starting. But it's a mutually beneficial relationship yeah. where we're pointing one another towards the goodness of God and towards glorifying Him with our lives. The only non-mutually beneficial discipleship relationship in the context of what you just said, where we're helping the other person grow as much as we're being helped to grow was Christ and his disciples. Right. The point is you're not Jesus. Yeah. Um, 
you need other people as much as they need mm-hmm. you. And if, if Jesus had layers of relationship, how much more should you be okay with having layers of relationship? Uh, don't feel guilty about that. And, and don't put that pressure on people to, to, to be that to everyone. You know what I mean? Like to the point of going heralding back to the glory days when we were smaller church, recognize that in that time, this still existed. There were still tears or, or layers of, of yeah. relationship there. It just was easier to hide. It just wasn't as prominent uh, because you knew everybody's name. It's okay with maybe not knowing everybody's name, depending on the size of your church. That Don't even feel guilty about that. But also don't let that allow you to become complacent where you yeah. don't go and talk to new people. Yeah. You know, like use that as, a, as an avenue of like, you know, maybe today I'm going to go talk to one new person that I didn't, I, I didn't know when they walked in the door. And just have a short conversation and just let it go and see where it goes. Yeah. You know, like, yeah. I think that's super helpful. So. Even, even I was thinking through something <laughs> as uh, we were talking about this. So I think that's been, hopefully that's helpful. So next week we're going to talk about experiences and these things are going to build a little bit. Yep. So we'll tie um, how relationships actually help bond us through experiences as well. Absolutely. So join us next time. We hopefully we'll be back next week for <laughs> another episode of the Pastor Discussions podcast, your weekly conversation on doctrine, faith, and Christian life.